Hi everyone, let's make this molecule. It's a conjugated polyene. It looks a bit like beta carotene, the stuff that makes carrots orange coloured, but I've modified it a bit to make a point. There's loads of ways to make this molecule, but I'm going to focus on using some metal chemistry here. A key thing to notice about this molecule is that it's got a very high degree of symmetry. In fact, we have 180 degree rotational symmetry with the axis coming out of the plane around that point drawn in purple. So that will actually be my first disconnection point. And that's because I identified that there's two sp2 carbons joined together. So I'll be able to do a cross coupling reaction here. So cross couplings are a really useful way to form carbon carbon bonds in particular, but also other carbon heteroatom bonds. The technology relies on using palladium catalysis. The general idea is that we can just stitch together two molecules, say at sp2 carbons, provided one of the sp2 carbons is bonded to a metal, I'm just going to call that M, and the other one is bonded to a leaving group, which I just call X, and this is often a halide. So just as an example, common cross coupling techniques use zinc, tin, boron, I know that's not really a metal, but it works quite well in these contexts. And the leaving group, this is often bromides or iodides, you could also use triflates, these are probably the most common reliable ones. So the mechanism for these reactions, we'll start with a species like this that has a leaving group X, and that interacts with a palladium zero source, which I'm going to represent like this. It will always have some ligands of some number. So just for formality, I'm just going to call that LN. Those ligands can be changed and optimized, but they are actually quite important for stabilizing the transition metal complexes and the organometallic intermediates that we're going to draw. Now, an inorganic chemist will probably kill me for doing this, but I'm just going to use some curly arrows to help represent the first step. I'm playing a bit fast and loose with the definition of curly arrows here, but I'm going to use two electrons from the palladium to insert into the sp2 carbon leaving group bond and attach the leaving group to the palladium center. These arrows are just more of a guide for the eye, which is perhaps a helpful extension of the model we're using. As we've lost two electrons from the palladium, palladium is now in the plus two oxidation state, it's still got the ligands on it, and the leaving group now becomes a ligand on the palladium itself. So that'll give us an intermediate like this. This first step is called an oxidative addition. It's quite a common way of forming an organometallic, such as this first intermediate. Now, if this vinyl palladium species comes across our other coupling partner, so that's a vinyl metal species, we can do a transmetallation reaction where essentially we're doing a ligand swap. So the carbon originally bonded to the metal will join to the palladium, and the palladium will lose its X ligand, which can form a bond to the metal. And that explains why we pick some of the things for M and X that we do, because in this transmetallation step, we spit out MX. And because that's often a salt, that can add a huge driving force, enthalpy wise, to this reaction sequence. The final step in the cross coupling mechanism, where the two ligands can combine together, spit out the palladium species, which would dump two electrons back on the palladium and reduce it back to palladium zero. So this is called a reductive elimination and gives us a useful organic product. We now have a new carbon carbon sigma bond as a result of this process. And importantly, the palladium zero is regenerated and it can go back around this cycle and interact with another molecule of the starting material. So we only need a catalytic amount of our expensive palladium species to get this going. In fact, you can get away with quite low loadings if you optimize these reactions. These types of reactions are complete game changers in organic chemistry and revolutionize the pharmaceutical industry. These reactions work really well when you have sp2 carbons involved. So for example, I've drawn here vinyl systems, but you could also have aryl systems and others. And there's been lots of research over the last few decades about expanding the reactant scope of this reaction, which has been pretty successful, but that would be a discussion for another time, I think. Okay then, so back to our retrosynthesis. That tells us exactly what components we need. We need to make sure that one side has the, a metal attached to it and the other side has, say, a halide attached to it. But otherwise, the structure of those molecules is pretty much the same. All we've done is tweak these end bits, and that allows us to make a major shortcut in our retrosynthesis. We can disconnect both of these species back to a common precursor, which looks like this, with an alkyne at the end. And that's because both of the motifs we require can be made by a carboillumination reaction. Now, as this might be a less familiar disconnection, I'll just highlight what the mechanism is thought to be here. We're now in the territory where it's pretty tricky to draw curly arrows, as we've got a lot of metals involved here. But this reaction can be very useful. And what we do here is we react an alkyne with trimethyl aluminium and we use another metal to help catalyze this. We use this dicyclopentadienyl zirconocene type species. In fact, we use the dichloride as a catalyst. So this is like a transition metal sandwich complex. 
The CP here is just representing the cyclopentadienyl ligand, which usually coordinates via its pi system as one big six pi electron donor. We could represent it as either of these structures, but normally we draw the circle form if we're going to draw this out. So just to sketch out the intermediates here so that we can see how this reaction works. The trimethyl aluminium on its own cannot react with the alkyne. So what we do is we activate it by complexation with the zirconium catalyst. When these two species get together, we form some interaction between the carbons and the chlorines with the opposite metal centers, which both have a bit of empty space in their coordination sphere. Now the bonding here can't really be represented by traditional two center, two electron bonds. I'm just gonna use some dotted lines for now to represent the fact that this bonding is slightly more fiddly, but it's known that this intermediate exists. This complex is fluxional and can rearrange to use just the chlorines to bridge between the two metal centers and formally transfer one of the methyl groups onto the zirconium center directly. This is thought to be the key reactive intermediate that reacts with the alkyne. And we can do a carbozirconation reaction that's adding that carbon zirconium bond directly across an alkyne, but we might be able to do that in two different ways. So I'm just gonna use the example I need in my retrosynthesis. All of this extra ligand stuff up here is very bulky. So the best way for an alkyne to interact with this would be to put its sterically smaller end in towards the zirconium. So I'm just gonna use a terminal alkyne here. So this is just arranging on sterics. And I could draw some arrows to guide the eye here. The terminal position with the bulky zirconium center will add to the end of the alkyne. And at the same time, the methyl group will transfer to the internal position. This type of process is known as a migratory insertion. So our next intermediate has a methyl group installed on the internal position and the zirconium is just added to the end of the alkyne. Now it's known that these ligands can dance around a little bit. In fact, they can do another transmetallation to give us this organometallic, which is known as an alane, because it's an organometallic of aluminium. But in doing so, we also release a zirconium catalyst, which can then go back around to the start of this sequence and help out another trimethyl aluminium to add across another alkyne molecule. Now this alane is getting quite close to being a bit like a Grignard and it can react as a nucleophile with strong electrophiles to form all sorts of species. And importantly for us, some of the things that this can react with is to directly attack something like bromine or iodine and that will form new carbon halide bonds. Or we can react with metal centers, say as part of a chloride salt, to form a different organometallic of our choice. So what we're gonna do in our retrosynthesis is to split our starting material alkyne into two make the alane and trap it out with a different thing. 50% of it can get a halogen and 50% of it can get a metal. We could use something like zinc chloride in this case. Okay then, that's enough of a detour. Let's go back to our retrosynthesis. Well, we need to find another disconnection point. There's still loads of sp2 to sp2 carbon bonds here. I'm just gonna do another cross coupling across here to sort of roughly go in the middle. So doing another cross coupling reaction would take me back to a species like this. So I'm just gonna pick this side as the one with my metal, and I'm gonna need another component with a halide, perhaps something that looks a bit like this. The alkyne fragment actually has a pattern that lends itself to another cross coupling type reaction. If I disconnect across the middle, this is an sp2 carbon bonded to an sp carbon. This can be disconnected using a Sonogashira coupling. This is very similar to the other cross couplings, although we form the organometallic species in situ, largely because an alkyne has an acidic proton on it, which the sp2 carbon species didn't have. This will take me back to a fragment that looks a bit like this, perhaps with two different halides on there. There is a reactivity window between bromides and iodides that we can exploit here. And we're also gonna need acetylene. Now there's a bit of a problem here. Firstly, acetylene is horrible to work with, probably wanna totally avoid that. But also if we're not careful, the acetylene is symmetric and has acidic protons on either side. So if we're not careful, we'll do a Sonogashira coupling on both ends of that alkyne and make a product that we don't want. So we're going to need to block one end of it with a protecting group and a very sensible one to use just a trimethyl silyl group. And we could just use this TMS acetylene. This is a much friendlier reagent to use in the lab. In fact, it's quite a stable liquid that you can just store in your fridge, much easier to deal with than an explosive gas. Even if you have bare acetylene in solution, it's a safety nightmare. Strong recommend to avoid it if you possibly can. Okay, and to finish off my retrosynthesis, I identify that I have the same pattern that I had before, so I can do another carboillumination to take me back to an alkyne. We could play the same game as before with the cross couplings, but actually I think it might be a good idea to make this alkyne in a slightly different way, because I happen to know some cheap and readily available starting materials that are very close to this molecule that I've drawn, specifically this ketone, 
This is an incredibly cheap starting material that comes out of terpene biosynthesis. And in fact, it's one of the main reasons why roses smell like they do. So this is a scent molecule. Being aware of things like this can really help push your direction in syntheses. And I'm just going to go on to the next slide to really emphasize why it's a sensible idea as a chemist to have an awareness of common molecules in nature, because it can make your syntheses way easier and much less time consuming. I'll also show you what reagents we need to convert that methyl ketone to the alkyne, but you might be able to see that all we need to do is lose water from that molecule, so we just need to engineer a dehydration reaction. Okay then, so this is my beta ionone. As I'm recording this video, this is currently available from chemical suppliers at 23 US dollars per 100 grams. Now 100 grams of this molecule is about half a mole, so you're getting quite a lot for your money there. Just as a thought exercise, I thought we could just have a look at the retrosynthesis of the beta ionone to show that actually it would be quite a lot of effort to try and make this from smaller molecules. First thing I would do is disconnect across the alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl like this. Now those reactions are easily done by aldol condensation or Wittig reaction. So in this case, a Wittig reaction will probably be quite easy because this phosphorine is cheap and readily available. But I think we could probably get away with the aldol as well. We just might get a few more side reactions, but there's no denying that would be a cheaper route. One thing we might notice is that there's a cyclohexene. That's a bit of a trigger for doing a Diels Alder reaction. But actually, if we look at what the intermediates we'd need, well, it's not going to work. We'll have an electron deficient diene, and using ethylene as a gas there is not particularly operationally easy. So I'm going to discount this route. That Diels Alder reaction is too hard. So the alternative disconnection would just be to cut across here and notice that it's an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl again. So therefore, I could do aldol or Wittig. The Wittig reaction will be quite tricky to do here because it's intramolecular, so you need to make the ilid on one side of the molecule and have your electrophile on the other. Or it would just be much easier to here to do an intramolecular aldol reaction. And that would take us back to something like this, which looks simple enough. We've got the functional groups in a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 relationship. And they're just carbonyls, so perhaps we can use some standard chemistry to make this linear precursor. But we do actually have a major problem here. We've got some major control issues. To do the aldol that we want, we must enolize at carbon six. But unfortunately, there are other enolizable hydrogens, in particular these ones I'm just highlighting in green. And so we'd have to be very careful we got the one we wanted. The one at the end here on the other side of the methyl ketone is the most sterically accessible one. And also, if we happen to form the enolate at position six, it's perhaps a less reactive enolate, because it's right next to these methyl groups, which would add some steric bulk near the nucleophilic center. Now, I think we're okay to discount the reaction between these two centers in purple between an enolate of that methyl ketone because this would be forming an eight membered ring and the eight membered ring will be much less favorable as a cyclization than any possible six membered rings but the one thing we really can't discount is the reaction between center two and center seven like this this reaction will go on to form this aldol condensation product which is probably the major product that's because it's got the better nucleophile the sterically less hindered enolate reacting with the more electrophilic carbonyl in the aldehyde, again for steric reasons. So we're not going to get what we want if we try to do this. Perhaps one way to do this would be to edit the starting material so that we definitely get enolization at position 6. I mean, common ways of doing this would be to add a beta ester and then later decarboxylation, but already we're making our lives way more complicated than necessary, and I think we should abandon this route. Now, it's not that we can't make this molecule, but our target ionone is available for very cheap, whereas our time is probably more valuable, and we're already making a multi-step synthesis here, which will take a while. There is, of course, another classical disconnection here, which is that rather than using an aldol reaction, I'm just going to intercept the alpha-beta unsaturated intermediate here with a star, and just make that CC double bond by a different type of elimination reaction. We don't have to use an aldol condensation. In fact, I'm going to give E1 a go. If I disconnect back to this carbocation, it would be possible for me to use carbocation chemistry to make this molecule. For example, I could do a disconnection that looks like this and move my tertiary carbocation to the other part of the molecule. I could make that carbocation by protonation of that alkene, and then we're sort of done. Just going backwards, that would be, for example, using something like HBr as a strong acid. We would react with the most electron-rich alkene, the better nucleophile. It'll attack the H plus this way, just obeying the Markovnikov rule to give me a carbocation which then could do an intramolecular cyclization, then finally have that proton picked off by an external molecule to leave me with the best possible CC double bond. That would be the one that's conjugated with the carbonyl. And I think that's a decent level of control. But again, we're going around the houses here. This is a bit of a waste of our lab time. 
if I wanted to disconnect this, well, I could do an aldol condensation on that alpha, beta and saturated carbonyl. We'd have to be careful of that aldol because we'd be proposing using the enolate of an aldehyde. So maybe we could use an enamine or something there. Although it'd be pretty easy just to use a Wittig reaction instead. Then this final species should be fine. We can just use some enolate alkylation chemistry here to do SN2 on this prenol bromide, which is cheap and readily available. Right, so that was really quite a big detour to try and make my point, but I hope it was helpful to think about things like this. In my synthesis of my original polyene for this video, I'm going to buy in the beta ionone and just be done with it. I need to do a dehydration reaction. Well, it's going to be a bit cheeky. I'm going to use the enolate and dehydrate that. So I'm going to use LDA at minus 78 degrees to form the lithium enolate and then react it with this phosphoryl chloride. I'll just draw the mechanism in a second. That species will react preferentially with the oxygen end of the enolate because the phosphorus oxygen bond is so strong compared to a phosphorus chloride bond. And then finally, if I use a little bit more base, just using LDA again, I'll be able to eliminate off a leaving group. So just sketching out the mechanism there, started off with a methyl ketone. I'm going to treat it with LDA to form the enolate. The oxygen gets activated as a leaving group. And then our second molecule of base can come in and do an E2. That will form another strong phosphorus oxygen double bond. This sort of chemistry is quite common in the synthesis of nitriles, but you can also use it to make alkynes as well. Okay, so next I'll do my carboalumination chemistry. So that uses trimethyl aluminium and the zirconium catalyst. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the alane and then just trap it with the metal of my choice. I'm just going to use zinc dichloride because I think that will work pretty well in the rest of this synthesis. Although there are plenty of alternatives you could use there. That will give me this organo zinc species. And that's ready for my first cross-coupling reaction. And we'll just hold that there for a second. The other component I needed was something like this, with the silicon protecting group. The cross-coupling needs a palladium zero source. So quite a common one would be this one, palladium DBA. And we only need the catalytic to come out of that. We need to make sure that palladium center has the correct number of electrons at each of its steps. So in fact, we need to make sure that there's a phosphine in there as well. This is all to do with stabilizing that transition metal in all the organometallic reaction steps. And you could optimize this using different R groups on those phosphines. A common starting place would just be to use triphenylphosphine. So I'll suggest that for now. Okay, what we're proposing to do here is actually called a Nagishi coupling. And that's because we've used an organo zinc. Organo zincs are really fast at transmetallating. So this reaction should work pretty well. You might not always be able to use an organo zinc, of course, because they can have Grignard like behavior as well. But luckily in our molecule here, we don't have any other functional groups that wouldn't be tolerant to that. We can make our coupling partner from TMS acetylene, which is available, and just react that as a sonic Gashira coupling. This is another type of cross coupling. Essentially, we need a palladium zero catalyst. We need some sort of phosphine. We need a copper iodide catalyst. We need a weak base in triophylamine. These two actually make the cuprate from the alkyne. And then we need a coupling partner. Well, I think we can just use this disubstituted alkene. The carbon iodide bond will react much faster than the carbon bromine bond in these sorts of conditions. So we should be able to get chemoselectivity there. Now this guy's actually available, but if you're interested, this is actually made from acetylene. Again, not necessarily my favorite with HBr and IBr. This is presumably going via some sort of iodonium species, which are getting opened by a bromide. But with all of those reagents, I'm happy to let someone else do that for me and buy it in. Pretty much just from a safety perspective, all of those reagents are horrible. Okay, so after the coupling reaction, I have this intermediate here. We no longer need that silyl protecting group, so I can just take it off using TBAF. That's an F minus source. Pretty good for forming bonds to silicon and convince it to release our alkyne. And next, I need to do the carboalumination reaction again. So that's trimethyl aluminium and the zirconium catalysis. Okay, and that will give us this alane. So what we said we'd do is we've made half of this alane in one flask which we would then go on to treat with zinc chloride, and that will give us the organo-zinc compound like this, just abbreviating all of this to R. And we can react the other half with a halogen, let's just say Br2, and that will give us the coupling partner that we need like this. And then finally, we can do another Nagishi coupling using the palladium source again and the phosphine, and that will get us to our product. So I made this video using some more modern chemistry than maybe in some of my other retrosynthesis videos. There are certainly lots of other ways of making this molecule. Like for example, I could have used lots of Wittig reactions, but this catalytic method will generate a lot less waste and should be pretty easy to actually do in the lab.